Welcome to our 2020 virtual online homecoming. I know you have been here with us for the entire week so far. Homecoming started November 2 and we will continue live with you right through to November 8. Today we are showcasing the College of Natural and Applied Sciences, Allied Health and Nursing. Welcome, welcome to our, our online viewers and for those who are viewing live, we're welcoming you to our webinar today. And just before we go into our live broadcast, please bow your heads wherever you are as we pray. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for another time with you. As we're about to go into this webinar, Lord, we give you thanks for the members of this college. We give you thanks for our past students and for those who will be presenting. We invite your presence to be with us today and always in Jesus' name. Amen. Our speaker for this moment is a past student of the College of Natural and Applied Sciences, Allied Health and Nursing, and we are so proud of our graduates, especially those who graduated and made a mark and is making a mark, and guess what? Each of you, whether you are a student or a graduate, we are proud of you because we know because you are a product of NCU, you will definitely make your mark. It doesn't matter how big or how small. Simply make your mark. Bloom wherever you are planted. As the usual, we are going to be meeting again today at 2 p.m. where we will be having our alumni scholarship award ceremony and our college so showcase. So after we're finished with our webinar today, go and have some lunch and then join us again so that you can be a part of this wonderful ceremony. Our speaker, Dr. Wilmore Webley, is currently an associate professor of microbiology and the director of pre-med and pre-health advising at the University of Massachusetts. Born in Bellasgate, Jamaica, he is the first person in his family to attend high school and college. Completing his undergraduate degree in medical technology at the then West Indus College, now Northern Caribbean University in the year 1994. Dr. Webley earned his Master of Science and Doctor of Philosophy in Microbiology at the University of Massachusetts with, the, with expertise in immunology, infectious disease, host pathogen interaction, and a concentration in vaccine development. He is a Fulbright Scholar, a recipient of the Distinguished Teaching Award in Recognition for Outstanding Teaching Accomplishments, a recipient of the Black Student Union Award for Outstanding Devotion and Dedication to Profession, and a Commonwealth Honor Co College Faculty Lecture Series Award and Presenter. He serves his university in various capacities, including faculty senator, a member of the Rules Committee, and the University Health Council. He also serves on edit editorial boards of the International Journal of Vaccines and Immunization, the Journal of Medical Microbiology and Diagnosis, and Microbiology and Experimentation. He is a member of the International Society for Vaccines, American Society for Microbiology, and the Chlamydia Basic Research Society. His research focuses on infectious disease mechanisms and the roles of specific infections in chronic diseases. Specifically, the Wesley Lab is pioneering work in chlamydia vaccine development and the role of pathogenic microbes in asthma initiation and exasperation. His work has been published in reputable international journals and has made significant contributions in the field of microbiology, vaccination, allerg allergy and 
immunology. With such an extensive background in the field of modern medicine, I can tell that you all are as anxious as I am to hear what Dr. Webley has to say on the topic, facts over fair, the status of vaccine development for COVID-19. Please help me welcome a past student of the Department of Medical Technology of which I am a part, Dr. Webley. Now viewers, as he comes, Right there in the chat, if you have questions, please go ahead and type in your questions because at the end, Dr. Webley will be taking your questions and your answers will be received. Thank you so very much for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, Ms. Bignall, for inviting me. Uh, it is uh, truly a joy uh, to uh, be a part of this celebration week. Uh, congratulations to the School of Nursing for uh, really what is a, a, a great run uh, for 50 years. Uh, that's pretty remarkable. So um, as the introduction stated, I am a proud alum of uh, NCU, West Indus College then. Um, I'm a proud member of the alums from our uh, medical technology program of which there are many, many of us. Uh, who have gone on to do um, some important work uh, overall in, in our communities. And so at this time, I will uh, share with you uh, my presentation here, um, looking at the vaccine development for SARS-CoV-2, which has become somewhat uh, controversial, a little bit uh, politicized, uh, but in the end, uh, the science really should speak for itself. And so overall, um, the whole idea of outbreaks or pandemics or epidemics is nothing new uh, to the human population. We have been dealing with outbreaks for a very, very long time. And I like to start these presentations by just reminding uh, people of that, that we've gone through the bubonic plague, uh, people call the Black Death, We've, we've, we've uh, managed to get through um, outbreaks of cholera uh, later on in the 16 um, uh, to 1900s. Um, we survived probably the closest pandemic that most, of, most people can relate this current one to, the Spanish flu of 1918, 1919, uh, which led to the deaths of between 40 and 50 million people. And of course, HIV, although we don't see it that way, is really a, a worldwide pandemic that is ongoing. Uh, and when we order them in terms of deaths, you see that the bubonic plague um, led to uh, the deaths of you know, over uh, 200 million people. So for sure, this is the big one, uh, but that's followed very closely by smallpox, uh, the Spanish flu, uh, the Justinian plague, um, that uh, some people felt could have been the smallpox. Um, it's just not clear what that uh, uh, agent was. But then, you know, came SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. Uh, but when we look back, this map was put out by the World Health Organization in 2018. And it listed all the emerging and re-emerging, new, newly emerging infectious diseases that we have to look out for. And as pathogenic uh, microbiologists and people who deal with infectious disease, we're constantly looking at the potential for an outbreak. But in its narrative, after listing Zika and Ebola as emerging and re-emerging pathogens, um, uh, uh, respectively, it listed a disease X that it said could be the cause of, of uh, a widespread outbreak. And many people believe that COVID-19 is that disease X. I want you to notice where we're having clusters of outbreaks of newly emerging infectious diseases um, in, in, in uh, North America, parts of South America, um, uh, in, in West Africa, uh, but also in South Southeast Asia, um, where we have seen the development of uh, many of these uh, infectious uh, microbes. But let's get back to um, SARS-CoV-2, because as you can see, here is the SARS precursor virus. This is what caused an epidemic 
um, in uh, 2002. But even before that, we knew about coronaviruses. Um, the 229E coronavirus was discovered at the University of Chicago by researchers in 1965. And this is one of the coronaviruses in addition to OC43 and the HKU NL63 that actually causes the common cold. And these are family members of SARS-CoV-2. And then you had SARS-CoV-1, of course, in 2003, um, uh, led to uh, an infection and death of over um, uh, 8,000 people became infected, just under 800 became uh, died from the virus. And then of course you have MERS COV that a lot of people in the world didn't really know about because it is uh, concentrated in the Arabian Peninsula, but actually has a fatality rate of 37%. It's way worse in terms of deaths compared to uh, the current coronavirus, but, and that was identified in 2012. What is common among these is that they all, uh, the vast majority of them seem to come from uh, hosts that we interact with, and these are bats and rodents. So the, um, these two coronaviruses that lead to colds in human, it is believed that they uh, have intermediate hosts. Uh, for the HKU1, it's not clear what the intermediate host is. Uh, but for all the remaining coronaviruses that we know to date, they really are spillovers from bats. And bats are, are seem to be a natural reservoir, not just a host, but a reservoir of these coronaviruses. And what we're seeing is that we're seeing that both MERS, SARS-CoV, SARS-CoV-2 seems to come have come over from uh, bats into the human population. And the question now is, what is the intermediate host for SARS-CoV-2? And a lot of people have speculated because of the closeness of the sequence, the, the genetic material that came from bats and also from pangolins. Pangolins are animals that you find in, in China a lot. Their scales are used for certain rituals, making certain potions. So they're hunted quite a bit. And the thought here is that these bats harbored a coronavirus that over time mutated and somehow through bat droppings um, got into the pangolin and merged or, or you had some sort of chimera of a pangolin coronavirus. And that now over time um, got transmitted to humans since they're captured for the scales and eaten for the meats and the wet markets in Wuhan and other places, and somehow got into the human populations um, uh, possibly years ago, and only now has made it to the place where it's easily transmitted from one human to the next. And that, we're not sure if the pangolin is really the intermediate host. It seemed probable at this point in time, but we're, we're not 100% sure of that. Um, and we're, not, we're also not 100% sure of how it made it from the pangolins into the humans. We're speculating based on the interactions that we know about. But this has led to our current situation where we have over 48 million cases of uh, uh, COVID-19 worldwide, um, just over a million, uh, 1.2 million deaths. Um, and several countries, including the United States, now have an increasing number of uh, this uh, coronavirus. Jamaica uh, has registered just over 9,000 cases with 215 deaths. Uh, and so uh, 190 countries worldwide have been um, uh, affected uh, by this virus. It continues to uh, cause mortality and morbidity. And so from the very beginning, researchers have been looking to see, can we actually make a vaccine against this virus. Why? Because vaccines have really been the most important um, aspects of intervention in our public health um, uh, arena. And the World Health Organization said many years ago that the two public health interventions that have had the greatest impact on the world's health are clean water and vaccines. And so the first known or recorded vaccine was made in 1796. And this was when Edward Jenner actually went ahead and created this vaccine um, against uh, smallpox. 
And as you can see, uh, towards the end of the 1700s, early 1800s, we started having other vaccines as people like Louis Pasteur and others came in. The BCG vaccine was created in the early 1900s. So it was uh, uh, the initial cholera vaccine. And the 1900s was a good um, period for vaccine development where in the 1942, you had a vaccine against diphtheria and then that was followed very closely in 1956 with the inactivated polio vaccine, the live polio vaccine uh, followed that in 1962. Um, um, and then we had measles um, vaccine and you had the rubella vaccine and that is followed uh, closely um, in the, in the uh, 2000s. Um, we had uh, combinations of vaccines where we didn't have to give individual shots, you could combine. So you had the MMR and you had the DPT and several others. In 2008, we had the development of the HPV vaccine and so on and so forth until uh, today. So vaccine development is something that has continued over the, 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 the years. And here you see uh, uh, an illustration of Edward Jenner administering at the time, which was really a pus that he took from one of his milkmaids who had cowpox. Um, and he realized that milkmaids who got infected with the milder form of the pox virus, the cowpox virus, did not come down with smallpox. That was ravaging the population at that time. And so he theorized that using this to vaccinate others would prevent them from getting the smallpox. And so he did that, scratched the arm of little um, James Phipps, which was the son of his gardener, and used that to immunize the boy, he became really sick initially, but after that became well and was resistant when he was challenged, um, he was resistant to smallpox. So that started the era of vaccination and also started the era of anti-vaxxers, people who say that vaccination was witchcraft and it shouldn't be done. So Jenner faced a lot of pushback um, uh, at that time. But over the years, what we've seen and as you can see from this diagram, is that vaccination has really done its work. Uh, for example, you'll see that you had um, hundreds of thousands of people getting infected by the measles right up until the point where the orange years where a vaccine was made until you had a vaccine. And almost immediately you had a significant reduction in the number of cases of measles. And you can see that with just about everything from the chicken pox to rubella uh, to hepatitis uh, uh, to the mumps, uh, you had uh, interventions that led to significant reduction um, in um, uh, those cases, both morbidity and mortality overall. And what could be more uh, uh, telling than this photograph? Uh, this photograph showed two young boys, similar age, and the, both of them were exposed to smallpox from the same source on the same day. And what you see is that the boy on the right has basically no lesions, probably one or two on his face, while the one on the left is covered in smallpox lesions. And the difference is that the young boy on the right was vaccinated against smallpox. The one on the left, his parents decided that they wouldn't vaccinate him. And that was the difference. So the question is, what is a vaccine and how does it work? And a vaccine is basically a way to prime the body so that it thinks it's under attack from the virus or bacterium or whatever you're vaccinating against. And it builds a response against that so that when it actually sees the real thing, it actually has an arsenal already uh, provided and ready to go so that you don't have the pathology of the infection. So what they do for a vaccine is that you have a weakened form of the agent, whether it's a virus or bacterium or some other infectious agent. You can have a weakened form of it. You can have a dead form of it. You can have pieces of proteins from it that you introduce into the body on various platforms. And what will happen is that you'll have an immune response. You'll spark an immune response. And not only will you have products that we call antibodies, these are Y-shaped proteins, that have the ability to bind to the surface of the infectious agent and neutralize it, effectively preventing it from being able to infect a cell or cause damage to tissues. So you render this germ ineffective. And so you have this produced, but in addition to having these produced, 
you have what are called memory cells. Some of these immune cells in the body actually get produced and they remember this agent that they were given initially. Uh, this is like creating a database of bad guys so that when you see them again, you have very little lag time in attacking it. And so essentially these antibody molecules and the memory cells become a shield, a protector against um, uh, this uh, agent. And for the, for the science people on uh, who are watching, essentially what you have is this. In the, if you have a natural infection, in the first time you see this infection, your body makes these antibodies via B cells. And your B cells are a type of lymphocyte, a type of white blood cell. Um, and these B cells get activated because they can sense a pathogen. They bind to it. They get activated with the help of T cells. They differentiate. In other words, they change their form into what is called a plasma cell. And these plasma cells are the ones that are able to secrete thousands of these Y-shaped proteins. Initially, they, sh they create this large one called an IgM um, early in the infection. But as you see, it takes about 14 days, seven to 14 days before you have enough of it so it doesn't take 14 days for the body to realize it's there. It takes about that time for you to have enough of these antibodies produced so you can effectively bind to and neutralize the agent that induced it in the first place. However, if you now come after a period of time, uh, 60 days, 21 days, or somewhere around there, and you reintroduce the infectious agent, the response is not only quicker, within just a couple of days, you're having more than the level you had here, but you also have a, a higher response. You have more antibodies being created. So this is your antibody level um, over here. And the amounts of it, the high levels of it, last for a longer period of time. Because essentially what happened in the first instance, not only did you make these neutralizing proteins, you actually made memory cells. And these memory cells now are what kicked in initially. So it doesn't take long the way it took in the first instant to create all of these cells, because you see our cells, unlike microbes that replicate every 20 minutes, our cells take about a day to replicate. And so that's what takes the long time before you have this initial response. But in the second round, these cells are, in, they are already in numbers. And so they can easily ramp up and they can increase these protective proteins that you have. And that essentially is what prevents you from having the pathology. So it's not that you can't get infected again, it's that when you get infected, the infection gets neutralized. So it's like having the pictures and the demographic of the bad guy in your database at the airport, at the ports, uh, um, at police stations. So when they see this bad guy, it's not like he's they, they're, they're always going to get him, but when they get him, they're able to quickly recognize that this is who it is and they can mobilize so that they take them out. It is on this principle that vaccines are based. So I'm going to play a video here now that's going to put all this together. Um, and give you a better picture of vaccine development. It helps to look first at how the immune system works because vaccines harness the natural activity of your immune system. There are about a hundred trillion bacteria and viruses on your body. Not all of them cause disease, but some are able to get inside our bodies to multiply and this can make us ill. There are barriers to stop this happening, but suppose some disease causing bacteria do get through. Your immune system is quick to recognize them as invaders. This is because the proteins or sugars on the bacteria's surface have different shapes to any of the ones in a human body. They trigger a complex chain of events involving many different types of white blood cells working together. One type of white blood cell is able to make antibodies to fight the invaders. Antibodies can stick to the proteins or sugars on the bacteria's surface and this kills the bacteria or disables them. However, not all antibodies will work against these bacteria. They have to be exactly the right shape, a bit like a key fitting a lock. Our bodies have a library of billions of white blood cells, each of which can make just one shape of antibody. Only a few of these antibodies will match the invading bacteria. Producing antibodies of the right shape can take several days. By this time, there could be billions of disease-causing bacteria in your body. Once the right cells are activated, they quickly divide and turn into a production line, making masses of antibodies that stick to the bacteria. Eventually, your body gets rid of all the bacteria and you recover. Antibodies remain in the blood, 
and some white blood cells may also become memory cells. If those specific bacteria invade the body again, the immune system will respond so quickly that you won't get ill. Vaccines work in the same way. They contain weakened or dead bacteria or viruses, or even just a few proteins or sugars from the surface. This is enough to convince the immune system that a real invader has got in. The same process takes place as when real bacteria or viruses invade our bodies, except you don't get ill. Afterwards, if your body ever meets the real thing, your immune system will remember it and get rid of it before you even know it's there. So that essentially is what one goes after. And here's why this becomes important. If you have a lot of people in your community who are immune to a certain infection, who have been immunized and are protected, it makes it harder for even the few people who are not immunized to get infected because not every pe person can get vaccinated. There are certain people with certain illnesses, certain types of underlying conditions that make it hard for them to get vaccinated. If they get vaccinated, they could be in serious problems health-wise. And so there are people in your community who are not vaccinated for that reason. So this animation, what you're seeing is that you're seeing what happens in terms of how quickly an infection is able to spread through a community and how widespread based on whether or not you have a good number of people who are vaccinated versus not vaccinated. And so essentially then what you have is that when you have a lot of people who are vaccinated, um, you actually have good protection uh, from uh, this infection. But when you don't have a lot of people vaccinated, uh, you have the, a widespread um, uh, uh, entity, a widespread event um, in the population. So that is why so many people have gone after trying to make a coronavirus vaccine at this point in time. Uh, it was the natural way to think about an, an infectious disease like this. And so at this point in time, what this is showing you is the number of vaccines that we have in phase one, phase two, phase three, and those in limited use for the current SARS-CoV-2 um, or the coronavirus. I think there are about six now um, that they have there. And so the ones here that you see that say approved for uh, limited use, these are ones that were developed um, in China as well as in Russia um, that their military developed. So these are not vaccines that are being given to the public. Their military developed them. They haven't gone through um, the different phases of clinical trial. In other words, they haven't made it through the safety and the efficacy testing um, uh, to this point. But there are over 200 um, different um, vaccine projects currently. We've never had this before, this unprecedented number of individuals, of, of, of companies and, and groups that are trying to make a vaccine against this um, uh, virus at this point in time. So let me go a little bit into the way the virus infects because this will inform how you'd wanna make a vaccine against it. So this, the virus that causes COVID-19 is called SARS-CoV-2. Um, and SARS-CoV-2, like all the other coronavirus members, has these spike proteins. And that's why they're called coronavirus, because these spike look like crowns when you look at them on the microscope, electron microscope. So they have these spike proteins sitting on the surface, covered with sugars. And so the spike protein is actually what binds to a receptor, um, angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor, on the surface of human cells. Now, a lot of our cells, cells in the respiratory tract, cells lining the blood vessels, cells in our kidneys, um, cells in, our, in the olfactory lobe, cells in our brain, cells pretty much all over the body and the intestines have these receptors on them. And so when it binds to this, it holds the virus um, stable and then the virus now uses another um, receptor on the surface of our cells called TMPRSS2 and this is another enzyme. And this enzyme is able to cleave or cut off the bottom of this um, uh, uh, protein. And what that does now is that allows the virus to extrude, to empty its nucleic acid material, its RNA into the cell. And this is an RNA virus. So what it's releasing is genetic material is RNA. And when it comes in, it now utilizes the cellular machinery um, called the ribosome to make more, to make proteins that this nucleic acid is coding for. But it also utilizes the replication system in the body. It has its own polymerase 
that it makes more copies of these so it can package them. And once it has made all the proteins that it needs and it has copied its nucleic acid, its RNA, it's able to package it and bud out of the membrane of the cell. Now, the, 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 the important thing to realize here is that when it does this, you can have hundreds or thousands of these viral particles budding, budding out of a cell at any given point. And that now leads to pathology in the cell. The cell typically lyses and dies um, once its assembly has been made. And that's part of the pathology that it causes. But at each of these steps where it's binding to the cell to get into the cell where it needs this enzyme that the cell has in order to cleave it, to cut it, so that it can get the material in at this point where it's making the nucleic acid material, it's replicating that at the point where it's assembling and budding out. Each of these steps, each of these points here are important steps that the virus absolutely needs um, in order to make new progeny and to continue the infection. And it means that these are also areas that have weak points that can be targeted um, for uh, a, 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 an intervention against the virus. So the virus is dynamic. We like to think about it in 2D, but it's a really a three-dimensional structure with these um, uh, proteins, these spike proteins on a surface. And these spike proteins come in trimeric form. And for those of you who are scientists, you'll appreciate this. So here's the trimer of the, the, the spike protein. Um, and then right at the bottom here, the spike protein gets cleaved. It opens up, binds to the ACE2 receptor, and that now pulls it closer so that it can actually extrude its material. And here's a little video showing you how that is happening. It's a little animation. So here are the spike proteins. The nucleic acid material is inside. So we, we inhale this virus from the uh, uh, environment, somebody breathing, uh, somebody speaking. They release these virus into the, viruses into the, the environment. We inhale it or we take it in through our eyes or our mouth. It gets down into the lungs, into the airways where the virus is able to use its spike protein, bind to the ACE2 receptor um, on the surface of the cell, use the TMPRSS2 to cleave so that the virus can now send in its RNA into the cell. So this is the virus RNA. And once this is in the cell, the virus wants a few things to happen. The virus wants more copies of this because it's intending to make more of itself it uses the ribosome. This is the, the, the a factory in the cell that makes proteins. It wasn't just there to make viral proteins. It makes proteins for our cells. That's how we function. And so the cell, the, vi the virus uses this so that it can make more copies of itself, packaging its nucleic acid material. And those now form new viruses that are released into the lungs. And some of those viruses will infect other cells, but some of them will get exhaled. So as you're breathing, as you're talking, they go up through the airway, through the mouth, and you now can transmit them um, to somebody else. And that's how one can transmit a virus like this. So here you go. So at these steps where the virus needs to bind onto the cell to get in and fuse so that it can release its nucleic acid material, all of these now become sites that drugs can be made against and also that one can make a vaccine against these, uh, this virus. So that is the basis. That is where scientists start in thinking, what is it that I'm going to target? That's the first thing that has to go through your mind. What is it that I target in order to make a vaccine or a drug against this virus? So, so drugs like remdesivir or antiviral drugs can work against the polymerase. This is the enzyme that the virus used to replicate its, its, its uh, RNA, its genome copy. If you can stop this from happening, uh, maybe by introducing um, uh, uh, analogs that are able to stop the strand from, from, from extending, then you can actually stop the virus there. If you can have an, a, a, a protein here that the virus needs on its surface and you can block that protein um, the way you're seeing here where antibodies are binding to that spike protein, you can actually get rid of the virus. And so there are multiple strategies that are being employed, as I showed you initially, there are over 200 uh, vaccines that are in process in different stages of development. Some of them are trying to use a weakened version of the virus. Others are, are, are using a killed or inactivated form. Others are just using some of the proteins on the surface and still others using RNA or copy DNA of the virus. These are typically safer. 
than your weakened form. The weakened form, you could think that it might revert and become strong again, since viruses can, can mutate. Um, so more than likely the ones that use either the RNA, which we don't have a virus, to, a, a vaccine today that has used a, an RNA as the basis for delivery. Uh, but again, these are the platforms. And so for the different companies, the Novia Pharmaceuticals is looking at the DNA type vaccine, AstraZeneca and CanSino um, Biologics, as well as a number of other institutes are using viral vectors. In other words, they're getting a virus that can cause disease to express the proteins of the virus of the SARS-CoV-2 in the individual so that we can actually make antibodies against it. And then of course, Moderna and BioNTech uh, uh, along with Pfizer, uh, they're actually making RNA vaccines. In other words, you put that nucleic acid for the spike protein into the cells inside of lipids. And the idea is that your cells will take that nucleic acid information, that, gen that genetic blueprint and make the protein, make the viral protein, which will be expressed on your cells. And then now the body will make a response again. And still others, the one Institute of Technology or Biological Products, um, the Beijing Institute of Biologics and uh, uh, Sinovax, um, they're making inactivated virus. They're killing the SARS-CoV-2 and using that now to inject, um, to use as a vaccine. So that's their vi vaccine platforms. So there's several different platforms. And this is showing you as of August 10th, you have over 231 vaccine candidates that they're being tracked. And you can see those that are using RNA, there are 24 of them um, uh, using an RNA platform, 14 of them using a DNA platform, um, several of them using replicating and non-replicating viral vectors, uh, nine of them using inactivated, and there are actually four vaccines where they're trying to use a live attenuated strain. And then you have your protein subunits, your virus-like particles, and these are in different stages. As you can see, the RNA vaccines are the ones, um, uh, and DNA vaccines have made it pretty far. They're in phase one, two, phase three uh, um, trials right now, the Moderna vaccine um, and the uh, 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 non-replicating one from AstraZeneca um, seems to be f further ahead at this point in time. So this is where we are in terms of the landscape of these, and each of these have their own um, advantages and disadvantages. So for your DNA vaccine, you have to somehow be able to get it into a cell. That's not an easy thing to do. Um, also for your RNA vaccine, you still have to get a cell to take it up and not degrade it. Um, so the disadvantages here is, is, is that although these are, are safe, we don't have a DNA vaccine on the market today and we don't have any RNA vaccines on the market today. So this is, these are unproven systems of delivering a vaccine. And that's the, the fear that people have. Is there something about it that we just haven't thought about? Um, uh, and that could come back um, to be a problem. That's why we have to go through uh, the testing. For the non-replicating viral vaccines, we have examples of some of these, but again, um, uh, uh, these can be uh, manufactured in, in, in large amounts. Um, but if you actually had pre-existing immunity to especially these, these uh, viruses that they're using. The adenovirus is pretty widespread. Lots of us have seen it before. The fear is that since we our bodies have been exposed to the shell that they're putting the coronavirus um, proteins on, that our bodies might actually take these vectors out and we won't develop a strong enough immunity against them. For the killed pathogen, the risk um, is that you might actually have vaccine enhanced um, a type of uh, uh, immunity, hypersensitivity. Um, and typically they'd say this is a weak type of vaccine because it's not replicating. Um, uh, uh, but again, these are the vaccines that we have to date. Now what has been happening as they've been developing these vaccines is that we've had what we call a huge anti-vax um, movement and people are losing faith in the vaccine. There's decreased numbers looking at um, uh, May to September in the United States, when they when they uh, surveyed adults, you can see that there's a significant drop in people who say that we definitely take a vaccine if we had one today. Um, and you know the number of people who say probably uh, is holding there, but you see people who say they definitely won't take it; those are increasing, and that is true um, whether they're Republican or Democratic leaning, and that is true whether they're men or women. That is true for every race, but as you can see, for people who are African-American descent or black, 
they are less likely to take a vaccine. And that is not a good thing for a vaccine. And here's why. If you have a vaccine, no matter how good it is, and people don't take it, then you won't develop the herd immunity that I showed you, where if you have a substantial number of people vaccinated, then essentially what happens is that that protects um, the population. So you reach a place where you've created a fence, essentially, around un unvaccinated individuals. If you don't have that, if you don't reach that place of herd immunity, you're still going to have infections of this virus going throughout the community. And if you have a vaccine that is not efficacious, if you have a vaccine that doesn't lead to immunity in over 70 or 80 percent of the, of the population, you will still have problems. You'll still have people, two in every 10 people or three in every 10 people who get vaccinated could come down with, the, with coronavirus disease, with COVID-19. And so people would still need to wear masks and all of that in between. So um, in September, um, Andrew Holness, our Prime Minister for Jamaica, posted on both Twitter and Facebook that Jamaica has been very cautious in approaching, he did a video of this, approving and using new medicine and vaccines. He said our ethics committee and health professionals maintain a very high standard and align their approvals with that of the highest authorities, talking about the World Health Organization and the Pan American Health Organization. He says, we're not taking any risks with the health of our people. Once there's a safe, tried and tested vaccine, Jamaica will ensure that we're able to access that vaccine and make it freely available to all who would want the vaccine. And this started a Twitter and Facebook storm where, to be honest, um, every publication of this was met with people who said something like this. I will not be taking any Corona vaccine Vaccines usually take 10 to 15 years to develop, and the fact that they are rushing to create one in less than a year, I'm not inclined to take any vaccine. I will not be in line for one. And this is the sentiment that you see. I believe in vaccines, but I won't be taking this one. From the, from the observer, from their article, um, they're telling them to do an investigation into the prime minister to see if there is some um, issue there why they're, they're wanting their people to take a vaccine. The problem is not the vaccine itself. It is the scenario where politicians and some wealthy persons are jostling to be in control of the news. One has just got to be careful. And so there is this strong anti-vax sentiment that continues. Here is, here is some of the, the feed from Twitter. Mr. Prime Minister, we want no vaccine for COVID. We do not trust the manufacturers. We do not trust the countries that house these companies and therefore the people of Jamaica will pass. Vaccine that was made in America and the American people are rejecting it. England rejected, Italy rejected, Africa also rejected. Why Jamaicans love free things so? So essentially, here's why this is false. There is no vaccine. Up to today, there has been no vaccine that has been approved against the coronavirus. So nobody is rejecting or taking a vaccine at this point in time. So that's the first thing to know. There is absolutely no vaccine at this point against the current coronavirus. So nobody's rejecting or taking it. Other people said they respect this prime minister, but I hope he never made plans with Bill Gates behind closed doors to implement restrictions on the citizens of Jamaica. And you can see this Bill Gates feed continuing that people said, does Bill Gates make vaccines? Uh, which is true. The Gates Foundation has been pushing for vaccines that are affordable and that can reach people in all parts of the world for over 20 years now, right? The Bill Gates Foundation funds programs to research vaccines, but they don't have any company that distributes or make vaccines. When this coronavirus vaccine, um, uh, vaccine project started, as usual, the Gates Foundation wanted to lend their support. But this whole notion that Bill Gates um, uh, wants to, um, has this big ph pharmaceutical companies um, and that what he wants to do is to input, uh, implant microchips into individuals so that um, they can be controlled once they get the vaccine. There is absolutely zero truth to this. So this anti-vaccine sentiment um, has really pushed a lot of these conversations about whether or not one would take a coronavirus vaccine. There is absolutely zero truth to it. People need to know that. Then the other myth that has been um, uh, portrayed in the same kind of string is that people post stuff like the zinc, vitamin D3, and vitamin C, take them daily to build your immune system and prevent 
I want you to look at that word prevent COVID-19. No vaccine, and if anyone has COVID, I can tell you what to take to cure it. They're blowing this nonsense out of proportion. Say no to our COVID vaccine, it is poison. This is a completely false statement, and it will lead people to their deaths. There is nothing wrong with taking zinc, vitamin D, vitamin C, having a good nutrition, having um, exercising, being healthy. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. The better you're off your immune system is, the better you're able to fight not just this virus, but any other virus. But here's the thing. It is misleading and completely false to say that any one of these things will prevent you from getting infected with this virus. I just showed you how this virus got into cells. This virus doesn't care if you've loaded up on your best veggie meat, it will infect you. The only question is what will be the outcome? Once this virus has infected you, there are very few things that we have seen now that I can actually restore you to good health for the people who get into the place where they're having serious infections. So again, the myth about this conspiracy um, with Bill Gates, you can see people are making these dolls of Bill Gates that they're putting around. They said Bill Gates admits uh, the vaccine will no doubt kill um, uh, uh, these hundreds of thousands of people. None of that is true. It is absolutely false. And my fellow Jamaicans need to know this. These theories falsely linking Bill Gates to the coronavirus vaccine were mentioned in 1.2 million um, times between February and April. And there's absolutely no truth to this. This is this misinformation has become worse than the virus. So what is the truth about vaccine development? Vaccine development progresses very specifically through several steps. First of all, you have to figure out what is it that you want to make a vaccine against? You know, which part of the microbe? Is it the spike protein that we're seeing here? Is it some other protein that the virus may? Uh, and then you have to decide how to deliver it. Are you gonna deliver it as a whole organism as we talked about, or as a subunit or an RNA particle? And then you have different phases of clinical trial. And this is what re I really wanna to get to, the different phases of clinical trial. Phase one of the clinical trial is about safety. So once you've decided in an animal model, if you give it to mice and ferrets and rats and rabbits or monkeys, and it seems safe, it's not causing injury or death to them, then you determine a dose and you get FDA approval. Um, you register it in clinicaltrials.gov and then you go ahead and you do the phase one. Phase one clinical trial is one that has small numbers of people, typically between 10 and 100, but more often than not under 50 people. And these brave people are giving what is called a dose escalation of a vaccine. You give them specific doses. So for example, the first Moderna vaccine, you had people who got 25 micrograms, 50, uh, uh, sorry, 100, and then 250. And then they watch and see what happens with these individuals? Are they getting terrible side effects after the first or second dose? If the answer is yes, then that they're having um, side effects, then they have to go back to the drawing board. Um, if, 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 you know, if at any point it's not safe, they have to stop it. If people, however, have responded well, then they can get approval at each stage. You have to get approval to move on to the next phase. So you get approval to move on to phase two based on the data that you're presenting from phase one. And again, in phase two, you're ch checking safety, but at this stage, you're also testing efficacy with a specific dose or specific doses. And here you, you, you're looking at people in the hundreds, not in the thousands yet. You're looking at hundreds of people and you want to get people at different ages, people from, from different backgrounds and races. And if everything has gone well there, where you're seeing that it is safe, you're not getting too many side effects, that side effects are manageable, and you're showing that you are making good responses, those antibody proteins and memory cells and T cells that I, I talked about, then you move on. And then if you get approval for phase three, which is what some of these vaccines are in right now, this is a completely different type of, of, of clinical trial from the first two. This involved tens of thousands of people, anywhere from 30, to 100,000 people could be enrolled in these types of studies. And what you're doing is that you're having a vaccine candidate and a placebo. A placebo is literally just water or sh sugar or salt that you're giving. Neither the doctors who are giving the shot or nurses or the patient or the vaccine company 
knows which patients are getting the placebo from which ones are getting the vaccine. They hire a third party company whose job it is to administer this, to code them so that they know who is getting what, but the medical professionals and the vaccine companies don't know who's getting what. So this is what is called a double blind case control um, uh, randomized trial, where you're trying to see for people who get the vaccine and they're exposed to the virus, how what percentage of those individuals become infected and have a pathology compared to people who got a placebo, what is the percentage of those people who become sick with the virus and have pathology? In other words, when you compare people who have been vaccinated versus people who have been not vaccinated, do you see a big difference in terms of protection? Okay, and that is the phase that we're in right now for some of these vaccines. And you can't carry out phase three unless you're, you the pandemic is ongoing. So if the, if the coronavirus should just go away right now, all of these studies would stall in phase three. And how long the phase three go on for is dependent on how quickly you're getting information back about how people are doing in this trial. So typically, again, a phase one, uh, a preclinical testing would last about five to 10 years in animal models and tissue culture. A phase one clinical trial, if nothing goes wrong, would take about three years. Same thing for phase two and phase three. And that's if everything goes right and you're not stopping at all. What has happened now, the reason why they can do this so fast with the coronavirus vaccine are twofold. Number one, for these clinical trials before SARS-CoV-2, before the coronavirus, they were all being funded by pharmaceutical companies, by um, federal grants and stuff like that. And for the coronavirus vaccines now, the top ones, they're all being funded by government money, by federal funds, unlimited numbers of money. In other words, amounts of money. In other words, what they're doing is that they're combining the preclinical with the phase one. They're overlapping phase one, two, and three almost. And essentially, what do I mean by this? Because after you've confirmed that the vaccine is safe and that is protecting people, you have to scale up manufacturing. Scaling up manufacturing could take two to three years. What they're doing now is that while they're going to phase two, two trial, if you've made it past the safety stage and they see, okay, people are not dropping dead if they have this vaccine, they're now going into production of the, of the vaccine. Now, it's very likely that when you reach the phase three, you might realize that this vaccine that you've been producing doesn't work. Well, because it's unlimited amount of money, um, they can just throw that away, they can destroy it. If you were doing this on a regular schedule, you wouldn't be able to do that. You would be losing a lot of money doing that. And so finally, um, Paulo Fitt here says that there's nothing magical about wearing masks. We need to wear masks, we need to social distance. Because even if you have a vaccine, and if the vaccine doesn't work very well, you're still gonna get infected. That is an important concept. So the most important thing we can do at this stage is continue to wear a mask, continue to social distance. When we get a vaccine, we're not gonna know immediately if this vaccine will work. And because of that, we have to be very thoughtful and very careful about it um, in how we go about um, uh, doing this. Uh, people say, okay, then how do you know if the vaccine is safe? What if the government decides to give us a vaccine that is not safe? How will we overcome that? Well, you have enough scientists worldwide who know about how to make a vaccine and who will look at that data and be able to effectively say whether or not um, uh, we can actually do that. Um, and this is a safe vaccine. So this is, this is really the issue now where creating a vaccine is concerned and where we are uh, essentially with a coronavirus vaccine. And I'm happy to take your questions at this point if we have any uh, from our listening audience. Not yet. Thank you so much, Dr. Webley. Wow, what an interesting presentation. I know my students were all logged in and they are eager to ask questions. Perhaps some may be 
a little nervous because I'm not seeing a lot of them, but we have quite a bit of questions here for you, Dr. Webley. And I have no doubt that you are ready and capable of answering all of these questions. Now, our first question um, here we have recently, there has been a whole anti um, virus movement and theories of vaccines leading to autism and other conditions. So, are there any downside or negatives to the vaccines? Go ahead, Doc. Good question. Uh, vaccines are a medicine, right? So any medicine you have will have some level of side effect. But what are those? Those for vaccines are a sore arm or people having a fever. Um, uh, there are people who might be allergic to components, like for the flu vaccine, if you're allergic to eggs, then that is something that you would have uh, an issue with. However, the autism vaccine um, uh, uh, connection, there is absolutely nothing there. In 1998, Andrew Wakefield, this physician um, uh, from England, published a paper in The Lancet that claimed that the MMR vaccine, the mumps, measles, and rubella vaccine, could lead to people um, uh, increasing their risk for autism. Uh, in fact, um, this study was so flawed, there were 12 kids who were used in this study. Andrew Wakefield did not get permission to use these kids. He literally um, uh, went ahead and went against protocol. He had 13 authors on there, uh, uh, almost all of whom withdrew their names from this um, list of authors. And eventually the article was retracted. In other words, the journal said this article should never been published. It had too many false claims in there. It was a lie and that was taken off. And as a result of that, um, they weren't able to continue with that. Over that period of time, people have done multiple studies with tens of thousands and even millions of people involved. And it has shown repeatedly that there is absolutely no connection between um, vaccines and autism, zero connection. And so the people who are using this still are people who are not looking at the data. Are vaccines safe? Vaccines are some of the safest medicines we have, and here's why. Vaccines are given to people who are well. In fact, if you're sick, you're most likely to not get a vaccine. Unlike other drugs, where you're given it um, uh, because you're sick and you weigh the benefits versus uh, uh, the risks, vaccines are given to healthy people, so they're held to a higher standard. And so safety of vaccine is something that people who develop vaccines take very, very seriously. And I would say that vaccines are some of the safest entities we have out there. We have had very few cases of people having a really terrible response to vaccine, maybe some allergic response. But the idea that you can die from a vaccine, that is absolutely just not true. We haven't seen that at all. Most vaccines don't even have the infectious agent in there. They just have components of it. Thank you so much. I am sure Mr. Nigel is quite happy with your response. I'm looking down and I see a comment here. Doctors have um, been on social media making the case against a COVID-19 vaccine. Their explanations and evidence appear credible. Um, but you're here being commended, doctor, for the evidence that you have shown and um, that you are promoting the vaccination. But this person is a bit confusing or confused. What can this person do at this point in terms of making a decision as to whether or not he or she um, takes the vaccine when and if it becomes available? And that, to be honest, that is uh, also something that I look at. You know, I have a family, you know, um, I'm looking to see if this vaccine is safe. And the truth is there, there have never been any vaccine in development that have had so many expert eyes on it. So I'm very confident that if we have a vaccine that lacks the safety and the efficacy, that there'll be enough people, enough experts 
who will see that and call it out before it becomes widespread. And I know that people are concerned about political pressure and other things that the FDA might approve something before it is out. Even the vaccine companies, because they have reputations to protect, um, have decided that we're gonna come together and we won't even put something forward unless it actually shows that it has that level of safety and efficacy. These doctors who have gone on um, social media and are talking about vaccines and the lack of safety of vaccines for coronavirus and stuff. These are people who are driving outside of their zip code. These are people who have gone outside of their lane. The fact that you have an MD or a PhD does not mean that you know anything about vaccines. The people who develop vaccines and who work with vaccines and who understand the immune system and the immune response and the process of our vaccine is developed and the safety initiatives that go forward are very specific. They're people who are immunologists. They're people who are public health um, workers who do this all the time. A lot of people have strayed outside of, of their comfort zone during this pandemic. There is a, 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 a psychological term for it that people have strayed outside of their, 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 their zone to say things that have no bearing on, on, on this virus because they just don't understand the microbiology or the immunology behind it. Uh, people like myself, we didn't just start into this lane when COVID-19 came around. We have, we have been thinking about vaccine and vaccine development and working with it in our research groups for decades. And so we fully understand what is going on here. And even then we have to be learning some new things and, and catching up in our own field. Um, moreover, somebody who is uh, it's outside their wheelhouse. So you have to be careful of people who are say, you know, okay, my, my expertise is in um, this area of medicine. I'm a pediatrician, but I'm going to tell you that this coronavirus vaccine uh, doesn't work. You have to be thoughtful about who you take that from. I'm not saying that um, a, a general practitioner or a regular physician can't know about vaccines. I'm saying they have to do their homework. Um, we have a few more questions and I know that you are very busy. So we are thanking you again for the time you spent with us. Um, we have a question saying, when looking at recent viral pandemics, we can see that the Ebola virus was just as dangerous as the COVID-19. Um, however, Ebola virus was dealt with better. Why? Well, the, the Ebola virus um, outbreak was very different from COVID-19 uh, in several ways. Uh, number one, the Ebola virus is a way more deadly virus. Um, uh, it wasn't as widespread as COVID-19. Um, the transmission of the Ebola virus um, was much harder. In other words, it's only people who were in close contact taking care of the patient who could get infected. And once you get infected with Ebola, Within a few days, you know you are. You start getting really sick, you're immobilized, you end up in the hospital. The difference with COVID-19 is that the SARS-CoV-2 can be transmitted from individuals who are showing zero symptoms. Uh, we've never had this type of uh, an, an infectious disease outbreak before where you have an infectious disease that can be asymptomatic in the individuals who have become infected. You're asymptomatic, and yet at the same time, you're transmitting it. Moreover, it's very clear that, that this virus is airborne, it's um, highly transmissible, uh, and it has a very high affinity for the ACE2 receptor that it binds to. Um, and so essentially people had to take certain precautions and certain public health measures. The reason why it hasn't been handled properly is number one, in this um, era, people who are living now have never been through a situation where you have to be on lockdown for so long. So we have suffered from pandemic fatigue where people who did very well, countries that did very well in locking down and protecting people, including Jamaica, who did an excellent job initially. After a while, people started getting complacent. People started going out and not wearing a mask. People started believing that a mask didn't make a difference and social distancing doesn't make a difference. And as a result of that, they're doing exactly what the virus wants. All this virus wants is to be transmitted from one person to the next. It doesn't care what you believe. It doesn't care what your political affiliation is. It doesn't care if you're stupid or dumb, rich or, or, or poor, short or tall. It, it doesn't care any of that. All it knows is that you have a cell 
that can accommodate it and it just wants to infect you. So I think where this has been handled poorly in the areas where it's been handled poorly is because number one, the public health measures that have been proven to work, people did not do their part in upholding that. The government alone can't make this happen. However, it requires good leadership. You need good leadership at the top to put in place policies that are consistent uh, in order to prevent the transmission. So again, it goes back to my last point that I made in this presentation, that people still need to social distance. They still need to wear a mask because even when you get a vaccine, number one, not everybody can get the vaccine at the same time. For sure, they're gonna give it to frontline healthcare workers. They're gonna give it to people who are especially vulnerable with underlying conditions before they give it to people who are healthy and young. And, and what we are seeing over the past several months is that it's the younger, healthier people who consistently defy the rules, have parties, get together, socially um, are not distancing. And as a result of that, you're having this spread. Thank you so much. Such an interesting time. Um, we are living through perhaps our first pandemic. It is such a wonderful privilege though, to have you, Dr. Webley, being so um, experienced in immunology, disease control, vaccine development, and of course, being a past student of the Department of Medical Technology at NCU. We are so happy that you took the time to be back with us at home, even virtually. Thank you so much for sharing in this webinar and for those who participated, thank you so much for your questions. As one person said, very interesting. If we could find another word to use instead of very, I'm just gonna allow you to put that word in because today we were given a different side, the facts, as it relates to COVID-19 and vaccines. Thank you so much and see you again at two as we showcase the College of Natural and Applied Sciences Allied Health and Nursing.